So long ago in uh, College Station, our workshop, which, which we have every summer, was called the Workshop in Linear Analysis and Probability. Uh, but in those days, linear was broad enough to include the nonlinear, and I'm hoping that that's the same here, that nonlinear is broad enough to include the linear, because my talk is in a linear, linear analysis today. So uh, when I get to uh, the new results, uh, it'll come from two papers that are under preparation. One uh, is joint with uh, Jopizier and Gidon Schechtman, and the other one with Gidon and Chris Phillips, who is uh, a C-star algebraist at the University of Oregon. So there are not too many definitions. So I'll introduce one or two later. Uh, the just want to set the notation that uh, L of X is the bounded linear operators on a Bonnach space X. And uh, I wanted to mention one foundational paper in, on L of X in uh, 1969 in JFA by Earl Bergson and Horatio Porta. Uh, and this is a, kind of a, a good background paper. One of the reasons I wanted to mention it is that, well, it's a very old paper, almost 50 years old. On the other hand, if you think about it, <clears throat> that's rather late for a foundational paper on uh, L of X, because uh, remember Galfond's work and Murray and von Neumann's work was so much earlier. And so it took a long time before uh, mathematicians began to do detailed investigations of uh, L of X as a Bonnach algebra. Uh, the other notation will just be for standard LP will be LP of the unit interval, or this can be LP of the Cantor set, whatever you want, whatever separable, purely non-atomic LP space you want. They're all isometrically isomorphic. And I don't think in this audience I so much need a motivation for studying these Bonnach algebras. But let me just mention uh, a, a, couple, a couple of them. C-star algebras and von Neumann algebras, I think, are the, the most important class of non-commutative Bonnach algebras. I doubt that anyone would say differently. But uh, after that, uh, you want to study the, uh, the next most interesting or important class would be bounded operators on a Bonnach space, in particular classical Bonnach spaces such as LP. Uh, another reason that's kind of a, a pure math reason is that if you look at bounded operators on Hilbert spaces, at Bonnach algebra, this looks very much different from the bounded operators on capital LP. It looks very similar to the bounded operators on little LP, but little LP and capital LP are very different when P is not two. And it turns out there's, the structure is very different and, and uh, the structure for bounded operators on capital LP is a rather complicated and interesting Bonnach algebra. And then there are connections to some other areas of, monic, of uh, mathematics, in particular harmonic analysis, which I will not very much get into. Now, <clears throat> at the very outset, I should say that typically when you're investigating LP, uh, you kind of think about P in a whole range and you prove theorems about them, but you still have operators from LP to LR when P and R are different. But when you go to the bounded operators on LP, the situation changes quite a bit. Suppose you take a, a homomorphism from uh, bounded operators on LP to the bounded operators on LQ, even for general measures. Well, it turns out if you want a Bonnach algebra homomorphism, that is, it's multiplicative as well as being a bounded linear operator, then there, there aren't any, except for a very rare occasion when P and Q are the same or when uh, uh, P is equal to 2. Uh, the reason for P equals 2, you get some things, is that uh, uh, Hilbert space is isometrically isomorphic to a complemented subspace of LQ when Q is in the reflexive range. So you have a uh, Bonnach algebra isomorphism from the bounded operators from uh, L2 to the bounded operators on, L on LP. But there's no other cases in which you have even a, a, a non-zero homomorphism. So if you want to study 
homomorphisms between uh, bounded operators on LP and bounded operators on LQ, you're stuck to Q being equal to P. But the measures can change. Now here is something, though, that's quite fascinating, is that if you take a, a bounded a homomorphism that's not one-to-one -one from the bounded operators on LP to uh, the bounded operators actually on any Bonac space, then, in fact, this Bonac space can no longer be separable, even though this is a separable LP space. It has to be highly non-separable. Density character, in fact, at least the continuum, which is some very large cardinal, typically. And that's true whether you start from little LP or capital LP. So for <clears throat> little LP, when P is equal to two, this is a well-known theorem. This is saying, uh, uh, this is proved by Kalkin. Uh, for, and little LP is not too much different from little L2 in, in this context. So how do you prove this? I think I'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, when you take a, a kernel of a homomorphism, of course, you get an ideal in the Bonac algebra, a closed ideal. Now, if you look at a closed ideal of bounded operators on a Bonac space, well, any ideal is going to, that's not zero, is going to contain finite rank operators. It contains one operator, and from that you get all finite rank operators. Where it has to be closed, so you're talking, it has to contain the closure of the finite rank operators. So as long as you're dealing with spaces with the approximation property, uh, if you take an, a, a non-injective homomorphism, the kernel has to contain at least the compact operators. So if you look at the Konkin algebra, this is what we usually call by the bounded operators modulo the compact operators on, on any Bonac spaces. That means that, that, these, that the Konkin algebras have no non-zero representations in L of Y when Y is a separable Bonac space. Y has to have density character at least a continuum. Now, when you're talking about P equals 2, there's only one closed ideal in the bounded operators on a separable Hilbert space, a non-trivial non ideal, and that's the, the ideal of compact operators. And that's the same thing that happens on little LP. It's been known since the early 1960s. So for little LP, this, this is the only possible kernel of a non-trivial uh, non-injective homomorphism on the bounded operators on LP. But for P, uh, but for capital LP and P different from 2, it turns out there are quite a bit of other ideals in it, as we'll talk about later. So you have a lot, lot more possibilities. So here's the theorem I just stated on the other page. And let me mention uh, the main lemma for proving this. Uh, suppose you take either little LP or capital LP. Then you get com commuting contractive idempotence projections, norm one projections, so that the composition of any two has finite dimensional range. And the ranges are all isometrically isomorphic to the whole space, either little LP or capital LP, depending upon which study that you want to do. So, so this is the, 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 the lemma. And once you have the lemma, the theorem falls out immediately because this is a, uh, this is a multiplicative mapping. So it takes idempotence to idempotence. And secondly, since the co composition of any of these are, are finite rank, and the kernel of this non-injective homomorphism contains the compact operators, it must kill these compositions, right? So the, that means then that the unit spheres of the ranges of these projections over in the target space have to be disjoint separated subspaces of Y, okay? And if you have a continuum of them, that means that the density character of Y has to be at least a continuum. So once you have the lemma, it falls out immediately, the, 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 the theorem. So the, here's the lemma, and uh, <clears throat> Um, I won't prove the lemma, but I think if, you, if you're teaching a course in which it's convenient to look at Bonac algebras, this makes a very good homework problem for the students. And maybe they want hints. So I'm going to give you some hints. Give your students some hints, I mean. The first one is, is that everyone, every student should know 
that it's very surprising the first time you see this, but of course we all know this, this fact and, and, and know a trivial proof of it. But uh, it's, you can suggest to the students if they don't know it that uh, they, they prove this, uh, this, that there are a continuum of infinite subsets of the natural numbers, so the intersection of any two is, is finite. A very surprising fact the first time you see this, yes? And once you get that, of course, you get immediately the case of little lp because you just project on, you just use these to give projections onto these almost disjoint sets. For capital LP, they may need another hint, and the hint is, well, there are lots of different ways you can think about LP. Don't think about it as being LP of the unit interval. Think about it as LP of, of the Cantor set. And with these two hints, uh, your students will finish the, the proof of it. Okay, so that means that if we're going to talk about homomorphisms, and let's say continue to have non-injective homomorphisms, from the bounded operators of an LP space to an LR space, you have to go to, to L, from LP to LP, and you must go into a non-separable LP, okay? But it turns out that you have an isometric Bonnach algebra uh, isomorphism from this Kalkin algebra of little lp into the bounded operators of some highly non-separable LP space. This LP space has to have density character of the continuum, remember. So <clears throat> this was proved by Kalkin for p equals 2. Uh, you could argue that his proof can carry over to the case of little lp. It turns out that it's also true that you get a Bonnach algebra isomorphism from capital LP. We don't know this Bonnach algebra isomorphism is isometric isomorphism in the case of capital LP, however. It doesn't follow from the proof. And this um, doesn't really follow from, from Kotkin's work. Uh, the first place I know that we have a proof is with my student, March Budding Harjo. A couple of years ago, we wrote a paper on ergodic uh, operator ergodic theory, and this turned out to be something that we needed in a more general context. We did it for more general Bonnach spaces, but I think as far as I know, that's the first proof. Then uh, uh, David Bletcher and Chris Phillips didn't read this paper. Of course, it was not in, op in C star algebras or something they work in, and they came up with another proof in uh, uh, last year. Now, these two proofs, those of um, Bletcher and Paulson and those of uh, Bodeharjo and myself, used a, the most natural left approximate identity for the, for the compact operators on these spaces. These spaces, of course, have natural monotone shouter bases, and the partial sum projections for those form a left approximate identity for the Bonnach algebras. And so these are the, the, the natural ones. Now, then the, the proofs diverge at that point. Uh, March and I used uh, ultra powers. And uh, Bletcher and Paulson use the Aaron's multiplication on the second dual of these spaces. And you may say, why don't I say, well, there's two Aaron's multiplications, but they're the same in this particular case. Now, what about other ideals, as long as they, they have one? Well, there are no other ideals, closed ideals, in the bounded operators on little LP. I've already said that, only the compacts. But for capital LP, as we'll see, there, there are some other ones. Uh, are there uh, other closed ideals for which you can have a Bonnach algebra is isomorphism into uh, the bounded operators on, uh, this should be the bounded operators on LP, of course, not, not, not LP itself. So, <clears throat> well, up here in the proof, I said we used approximate identities, as did uh, David and Chris. However, one thing that uh, Chris and, and Gidon and I proved is that the compact operators on LP is the only closed ideal that has a even unbounded, possibly, left approximate identity. So that means that in order to do an analogous thing for other ideals, we have to have some new ideas, new techniques, in order to see if we can, if we can do this. Now, this is not our problem. 
Uh, it goes back at least to Christian Lemardy in 96, and probably much earlier than that, who proved a very, very interesting fact here. He showed that if you take an arbitrary ideal in the bounded operators on LP, then you can uh, get an isometric algebra isomorphism into the bounded operators on some Banach space. Well, that's trivial, but the Banach space can actually be taken to be a subspace of a quotient of LP in some space. So you want it, so up to a subspace of a quotient, we have an answer to the problem, but that's, of course, subspaces of quotients of LP are quite different from LP itself. So it's, uh, so this was, he raised this in 96 and it's still open. Now, there's no ideal for which we know the answer one way or the other, other than the compact operators. Okay, so finally we come to the main thing I want to talk about, and that is just what are the closed ideals in the bounded operators on LP? So I've already said there are a few, but instead of jumping all the way to LP, let's start with a general Banach space. How do you build closed ideals? Well, we've already talked about the compact operators, and it's the smallest one as long as the space has the approximation property. Another one that always exists is the weakly compact operators. Of course, sometimes the weakly compact <laughs> operators are all bounded operators, that's, but that's equivalent to the space being reflexive. Okay, but other times it will definitely not be. A very important one, and one that plays a, a central role in the study, is the strictly singular operators. So these are the operators that are not in isomorphism when restricted to any infinite dimensional subspace. Typically, these are different from the com compact operators. Of course, they're not all bounded operators. Typically, they're different from the compact operators, uh, but sometimes they're the same. For example, on Hilbert space, uh, separable Hilbert space, strictly singular is the same as compact. And on little LP, strictly singular is the same as compact. But on all the other LP spaces, strictly singular is quite different from, from being compact. Of course, if we're dealing with a unital ring here in the bounded operator, so every, um, every, ideal is, every proper ideal is contained in a maximal ideal, proper maximal ideal. And uh, these maximal ideals are automatically closed because the invertible elements of a bonic algebra are open. Okay, so as soon as you go to a maximal ideal, just using normal algebra, you have a, 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 a large closed ideal. But what are the maximal ideals? And be very interesting if you have a largest ideal. So <laughs> here's a definition, said so not too many, here's another one. M of X is all those operators on bounded linear operators on X, so that the identity operator does not factor through T. Well, if you think about it, it's clear that. Uh, M of X is closed under multiplication on the right and the left by bounded linear operators. That's the main property of an ideal. But you can't forget the other property of an ideal is that it be closed under addition. And so it's not true that M of X is always closed under addition. But if it is closed under addition, then it's, it's an ideal, and clearly it's the largest ideal. All right, because this Now, when you're talking about LP, the M of X actually is an ideal. It's closed under addition. That's actually not, not at all trivial. It was proved by influence starboard for P equals one and uh, get on and uh, Bernard Moray and Leor Zafiri and myself for the other values of P. So, and another thing that's true about this M of X is that it's identified with a set of capital LP singular operators. So I define strictly singular as not being an isomorphism on any infinite dimensional subspace. Uh, a Y singular if it's not an isomorphism on any subspace isomorphic to Y. So it's kind of a localization of the notion of strictly singular. So that uh, strictly singular is the same as being Y strictly singular for every infinite dimensional space or for every subspace of the domain, it's the same. Now, you want to know what happens when you look at a Banach algebra modulo its maximal ideal, or any ring over its maximal ideal for that matter. Uh, but the fact is, we don't know anything about the quotient 
of the bounded operator, so LP, by its unique maximal ideal. For the little LPs, we do, because this is a Kalkin algebra. This is just the bounded operators modulo of the compact. So this whole subject is still wide open 50 years after it started being investigated in some serious way, because we don't know nothing in this about this. <clears throat> so how do you construct ideals? Because I want to talk about building ideals in these spaces. <clears throat> a typical way is just to take an operator between Banach spaces and, let the, and to try to define an ideal by, take, by taking the all operators on the Banach space that factor through this given operator. Okay? So this operator doesn't have to go from x to x and go from two different Banach spaces. It doesn't really matter. You can still build this. So it's obvious that this is closed under multiplication on the right and the left by uh, operators on, on, on x. So it's an ideal if and only if IU is closed under addition. And so, of course, you could look at the ideal generated by this operator, but the simpler thing that to do is to just use use that, that uh, have the property that IU is closed under addition, and you can guarantee this just by making sure that the direct sum of U plus U from the direct sum of Y with itself to Z with itself factors through U. As soon as you have that, that means that IU is closed under addition pretty trivially. So you just look at this kind of operators. Well then, once you have this, since you, you'll have an ideal, and it'll, uh, as long as it's a proper, proper ideal, the closure also, also will be a proper ideal. And that's just the same as saying that IU does not factor through U. So if, you, if IU does not factor through U, it doesn't factor through U closure, more or less obvious. So you always have proper ideals this way, as long as you start with an, uh, an operator that is x singular. OK, so here I just wanted to repeat my notation before I introduce one more definition. Uh, I u, all the operators on x that factor through u, s of x is a strictly singular operator. Now I said these play strictly uh, an important role. And uh, so let's make that more explicit by calling an ideal small if it's contained in the strictly singular operators. Small ideals, because they're, all the operators are strictly singular. Strictly singular operators are important. You know their spectral theory is the same as the spectral theory of compact operators. They're very close to compacts in some sense. Otherwise, we'll call it large. Now, in some spaces, a large ideal contains the strictly singular operators, for example, on L1. On other spaces, it's not true. A large ideal doesn't necessarily contain all the strictly singular operators. That's the case on all the other capital LP spaces. Other than. So to say that an ideal is small, well, you, of course, the operator generating, the way to guarantee that is that this operator that you use be strictly singular. And of course, to make sure it's an ideal, you want to know that U plus U factors through U, as I said. How do you build large, ide uh, uh, large ideals? Well, you do the same thing. You take IU, but you let U just be the identity operator on some complemented subspace of X. So then the project a projection onto Y from X will be, a, will be a strictly singular operator in this ideal. So this will give you a, a, a large ideal. Uh, and to make sure it's closed under addition, you just make sure you choose a complemented subspace, which is isomorphic to its square, or something like this. Of course, it's silly to write I sub I sub Y. <laughs> I'll just write I sub I sub Y as I sub Y. <laughs> Here I've repeated the definitions and to give examples of small closed ideals in L1 because I want to talk about L1 next, capital L1. The compact operators, of course, strictly singular operators, and the weakly compact operators. So, you might, so why are the weakly compact operators on L1 uh, small? Well, they're actually equal to the strictly singular operators. This is a classic classic result. Every weekly compact, op every, the, the, these are just the same thing. What about large closed ideals? 
Well, you can have the I ideal of operators that factor through little l1. Little l1 is, is isometrically isomorphic to even a norm 1 complement of subspace of capital L1. So this is a large ideal, and it's, it's a proper one. And uh, then you have the, the, the largest ideal, which is uh, we've already talked about. And it turns out that this ideal and this ideal are different. Actually, it's not completely trivial to prove this. The proof I know is to use convolution by a biased coin, so harmonic analysis gets involved. And that gives you uh, uh, an, uh, 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 that operator on L1 is, is, uh, is, is in here, but it's not in here. It preserves copies of L2, so it's not strictly singular. Now, interestingly enough, these four ideals was all that was known for a very long time. And uh, this was one of the problems in, that uh, Peach mentioned in his uh, book, Operator Ideals, whether you can have infinitely many closed ideals. So we have four. Four. <clears throat> now, as I've already said, it's easy to build closed ideals. You just find a, take a, your favorite operator and look at all the operators that factor through your favorite operator. But, and you can do that for different operators, and you hope to get different ideals. But of course, the difficulty is you don't always get different ideals. Now here's, let me give you an example of this on L1 where things go bad. Suppose you let, you take the ideal of operators on L1, which factor through LP. This is not, it's not closed yet, so they're all different. But as soon as you close them up, you just get all the weakly compact operators, all the strictly singular operators. So they look different, and at the non-closed level, they are, but as soon as you close them up to study the Bonnock algebra structure, you, they're all the same. So I certainly thought that for a long time that if you wanted to find infinitely many, the real thing, you find one. Because usually you're, the way you're building these things is to look at uh, I, I sub u, where u is a nice operator, and there's lots of other operators that look related to it, but completely different. You get one that's different, then you'll get, on, you'll get a bunch. So get on an I last year, last January, in fact. We, we, we were able to do that, and I'll tell you what, the, what, what we did. We take the identity, formal identity, sorry. We take the formal identity mapping from little l1 to l2, and then compose that with the embedding of L2 into L1 that maps the unit vector basis of L2 to the Rademacher function. That's nice amorphous. That's the most natural, maybe, Euclidean subspace of capital L1, the span of the Rademacher, the Rademacher function, sir. And we have, of course, probability going for us here and some other things. And we were able to prove that this, the closure of this ideal is different from all the previous known ones. So once we got one, we were sure we were going to get infinitely many. So how, do, how are we going to get infinitely many? Well, you do something that's analogous but quite different. You look at a similar thing, but you map the unit vector basis of little l1 not to the Rademachers, not to Euclidean subspace, but to a copy of little lp. And how do you get little lp and capital L1? You take uh, IID, p-stable random variables. Everybody knows this. So these ideals, of course, are different. But as soon as you close them up, they're all the same. So we, at this point, we had increased the number of known closed ideals and bound operators on L1 by 25%. <laughs> and at this rate, we weren't going to be finished before the universe ended. So something else had to be done. So we came to. Sorry. Why is it natural to look at p stable here and not just any sequence of random variables? Well, that would be natural too. But once you get them for p stables. But do you know that if you how does it depend on the? Oh, I, I, we don't know that you. Mm, no, I. Probably you get the same thing. Oh, if you, you if you. Of the sequence of integrable. Like probably. Not sure, but probably, yeah. I mean, the, the techniques would, yeah. If they're uniformly integrable, yeah. Okay. But, but that doesn't completely answer your question. Yeah. 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 So 
in the fall, we were together at MSRI again. Joe Pizier was also there, and so we, we talked, and, and finally the three of us managed to uh, solve the problem and get not just infinitely many, but a continuum. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit. However, <coughs> if you talk about closed ideals, I mean, uh, large ideals, then we still only have two. And of course, it's connected to this famous problem, whether every infinite dimensional complement is subspace of L1 is isomorphic to either little L1 or capital L1. If you can get another complement of subspace, you look at the ideal of operators that factor through that new complement of subspace, you'll get at least one more. Uh, but an interest, another open problem is whether you can have more than a continuum of closed ideals. And you say, wait, 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 L1 separable. What are you talking about? Yeah, L1 is separable, but you're talking about ideals in L of L1, which is highly non-separable. So there's no reason that you should have only no more than the continuum of closed ideals. On the other hand, as far as I know, there's no known separable Banach space, so that there are more than a continuum of closed ideals in the bounded operators on them. If there are, I'd like to learn about it. So how do you get these new ideals? Well, it's a little bit similar to what Gidon and I were doing. You, again, take a... a, a a basis to basis mapping from little L1 into, into capital L1. And, but you want to think about capital L1 this way, which is a natural way for the other operator too. But you now, now you want to make, make, map the unit vector basis to a carefully chosen lambda Q set of characters. What does lambda Q mean? You know what characters are, okay. Uh, uh, being lambda Q just means that the L1 and the LQ norm are equivalent on the linear span. And this forces the characters to be uh, acting like an orthonormal basis in the Hilbert space, both in the L1 norm and the LQ norm. Now, the Rademachers are, this, are a simple example, the simplest example, of characters, they're of course, uh, that uh, are lambda Q actually for every finite Q. And that's one of the properties of the Rademacher function. So this is kind of a, uh, another way of looking at, at things that are related to the example we had in January, but has the advantage of, of, of maybe not always giving us the same ideal. So we'll use, in order to do this, we used Morgan's solution to the lambda Q set problem. So what is that? Morgan, there was this famous problem of Rudin. Uh, whether you could have, for a Q bigger than two, say, uh, a lambda Q set that wasn't lambda Q plus epsilon for every epsilon. And he solved this for Q and even integer, but wasn't able to do it for the other values of Q. And in one of Morgan's, one of his uh, 300 famous papers, he, uh, he, he solved this. I'm, I'm discounting the other 500 that are less famous. So, uh, I, but I want to say to this audience, in fact, if you don't like to use uh, a result this deep, you could also use results from Banach space theory uh, from the 1970s about packing um, Hilbert spaces into uh, low dimensional L LP spaces. So you could, so, but since, since this is available, I'll, I'll just stick with this. Now, of course, these ideals look different, just like the other ones. That, are really not different, but the hard part is, is to figuring out how to prove this, that they are different. This, you mean any ideal coming from UQ, you just need that the, it's a lambda Q set? No, 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 yeah, I should state this. Carefully chosen lambda Q set. For, it's not a, one thing you need is that the lambda Q set you have is lambda Q, but not lambda Q plus epsilon for any epsilon. That also is not enough as far as we know. You have to build it in the right way. And that's the technical part that I'm not going to get into. I won't say it's so difficult, but it's, it's messy. But what is the problem? Well, you, you want to build it so it's in the right dimensional space. You have to repeat each embedding the same way and filling many times to have the direct sum property. You know, it's, 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 not, it's, it's just not very pleasant. Yeah, and if you build them, if you build them to have those properties, but you choose different characters, uh, we don't know if you get the same ideal. No, there, there are a lot of th things here, but. Uh, but you need this property, not the Q plus epsilon. 
Absolutely, you need absolutely need that for the proof, of the later proof. Yeah. And you know if you are. But you also need the dimension thing. You need to know the reason. You need to know. You need to know the reason. You need to know that when you choose n, it's sitting in 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 L, in in the uh, uh, end of the q over two dimensional space too. But if somebody gives you a number p set, which is also a number p plus one set, you know that that you you that the values are the two ideals are the same. No, no. So it could be that. But do you know, let's say, Lacanary sequence here? No. Can't work here. So it could be that Lacanary. That's conceivable. Uh, that's conceivable. That's conceivable. Yes. Oh yeah. These things are very hard to analyze. You're right. No, I don't know. We did what we could do. Okay. Okay. I'll come back to this. How much time do I have left? But, They're, they're, I, they're small because the operator you're using is strictly singular. It's mapping a little, little L1 to something isomorphic to little L2. So they're all small. The basic operators are all strictly singular. How much time do I have? Ten. Only 10. Okay. So uh, I hope to uh, say the, uh, one of the main steps in, in, in the proof of showing they're different down here. I won't show the construction, but there's a lemma that's used to do that that I think is really nice that I want to show. Okay, <clears throat> but I want to first get talk about the, the these other things. What about capital L LP bounded operators on capital LP for P different from one and two? Well, the, it's easier to talk about the large ones at first. Because, I mean, they, they, that was what was done first. Uh, and Schechtman, in way back in '75, constructed. Uh, infinitely many different complemented subspaces of, of LP. They're all isomorphic to their square. And this gave infinitely many large closed ideals. And six years later, Borgan, Rosenthal, and Schechtman souped that up to get Aleph 1. So there, we know there are Aleph 1 large closed ideals in the bounded operators on L1, in LP for P different from 1 and 2. As, whether there are more than that, we don't know. And as far as we know, uh, there are, can be as, as many as two to the two continuum. But between Aleph 1 and the, it's natural to think there should be the continuum, but no one's been able to do that in the last 40 years. Now, what about small ideals? There's some very interesting work done all in this millennium for small ideals. And I don't want to give you all the history, but there's a, uh, a very nice paper by uh, Thomas Schlumprecht and, and Andras Zox that's, had, this is misleading. The, the, the paper was actually written four years ago. It took four years to get it published. I don't know why. The, uh, that there are a continuum of small closed ideals in the bounded operators on LP. And this solved another pro uh, pro uh, problem out of, out of Peach's books. And they're, the ones they constructed are of the form that I've, I've described, in which they, uh, where the operator U is a basis-to-basis -basis mapping from an LR space to an LS space. You can vary these things, when, depending upon what they're doing. And, uh, uh, but the, the kicker here is that you don't take the natural basis-to-basis -basis mapping. You, give a, you take a different basis for little LR, different basis for little LS, and you take, you take a basis-to-basis -basis mapping there. And whether you can get more than continuum is still open. So let me go back to this, and I want to get to this lemma. So this lemma <coughs> is a very simple lemma, but I think it's quite surprising. Suppose you take n vectors in LQ, and it has this lambda Q property. Lambda Q says that the L, so think about these as being characters, because in the applications they are. So this is getting, uh, an upper L2 estimate for coefficients that are plus or minus one. Lambda Q would mean that you have an upper L2 estimate for all linear combinations, okay, if they're characters. And suppose that this, uh, you have an, an operator from L1 to L1 of this dimension. I use the 
this is, of course, could be a little out of one of this dimension, but I put the probability measure on there, it's more natural. Uh, has the property that uh, this operator is bounded away from zero just on these very small number of points. That already forces the operator to be a big norm. Because see, if you think about epsilon and C as being fixed, then as n goes to infinity, as long as q is bigger than p, this is going off to infinity. So it's a, it's a way of forcing an operator to be unbounded just to have it, uh, the image of a very few number of points being bounded away from zero. But of course, these points are special. They're, they come out of a lambda q set. Now, I'm interested in the case where p is bigger than two, bigger than or equal to two. All the applications are there, and this is really a lambda q set. But the, the dilemma is true in this generality. This is the dimension. What if you change the dimension to k? Okay. Who, who? to the power p over two. Well, it's the same. Yeah, you, I just call that. I just call k p over two. Okay. So, uh, yeah. This is general. No, 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 no. It's at the n to the power p over two. Just call it l one k. Mm -hmm. well, n is the number of vectors. That's what I did. K is n to the p over 2. There's no difference. It's just more convenient to state it this way, all right? Not the same n. It's the number of vectors that you start. Yeah. I just need, I just need this, this, this dimension in order to get this lower bound. OK, so now this L1 space can be any L1 space. It can be a finite dimensional L1 space. But if these are characters satisfying this condition, remember the dimension of this L1 space must be at least capital N to the Q over two, okay, okay. to the Q over two. Yeah. So in, in the application, and in order to have this have actually to make any sense, this space has to be of dimension N to the Q over two. So that's bigger dimension. So you're actually lowering the dimension. You're going into from to a lower dimensional L1 space. But that's all it takes to force this operator have to have big norm. So to me, this looks extremely surprising. It's a very, very simple lemma to prove, but I think it's going to be useful. And my, my joke is not a complete joke because I know something about simple u lemmas being, becoming useful. And this one looks like it, it, it's going to be. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to skip this and jump to the proof of this to show you how simple it is to prove. So here's the lemma, okay? And you prove it in doing the most obvious things. Took us a long time to do the most obvious things, but remember, all the authors of this paper are over 65. <laughs> so you, you have uh, these norm bigger than epsilon. So norm these with a linear functional out of L infinity. And when you norm, use a norming function L infinity, of course, they're constant modulus 1, or you can take them to be. Then just sum all of these guys and you'll get at least epsilon n. That's this hypothesis. And this is the way the action is done. So I couldn't fit the whole proof on one page, but actually I did. This is the first line of the proof, okay? That's just repeating what I said. Now you do something completely trivial. You change this a to b, and I just changed this a and this a to b, and I changed, I souped over this A. That's a very weak inequality. Now, but the advantage of doing that is that that's just an L infinity norm, okay? And now this T is a bounded operator between L1, so T star is L infinity, so you can pull this operator out. That's not too deep. Now comes maybe the main step, which is also trivial, is that here you have an L infinity norm in the probability space, and you replace that by the LQ norm over the same measure space, and you have to pay a price. All right? And the price you pay is the dimension of the space to the 1 over Q, and that's, a, that's this price. Now we do another trivial thing. This is an, an L1 the probability space. This is an L1 norm. You replace it, an LQ norm. You replace it, uh, L1 norm. You replace it by an LQ norm, just pulling the 1 over Q out. That's with constant 1. 
And then you're done because this is your hypothesis. These guys are, take on the values plus or minus one, and the hypothesis on the VIs is exactly that for any, any C, you don't even have to do the integration, for any C, what you have, this first integral, is, is at most this quantity. So now you start with this, you end with this, you have different power of n, you just take the n to the other side and you're done. Is my own talent? Hmm? Okay, so, it's a, so, so this is, this is a, a, a trivial proof, but I think the lemma is nevertheless surprising and, and certainly we know it's useful to do so, some things. So let me go back to this result, one of the main results in this other paper that we're doing, you get on our doing, this one with uh, Chris Phillips, in which we're sh showing no left ideal in the bounded linear operators on, L on LP. Uh, no, uh, sorry, no left approximate identity in the bounded operators in LP except for the compact operators. Here's, I actually wrote down the definition of approximate identity here. So there's, in one case, there are several different cases for this. P, P equals one, P between one and two, and P bigger than two. So the proofs are different in each of the three cases. But here's a, a harmonic analysis proposition that's used in one of those cases. Suppose you take the, 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 the natural basis for little lp. Well, one of the natural bases for little lp is to represent little lp as this. This is isomorphic to little lp. And you take uh, the natural unit vector basis for the sequence space, which is just little lp isomorphically. And you look at the normal basis for capital lp, the Haar basis, and normalize it in lp. And so you do it the basis to basis, and you index it in the usual way. And you take the basis to basis mapping from, from this space to this space, okay? And then that extends to a bounded linear operator from this represent a, a little, of little LP into capital LP. So the important thing here is that you have a bounded linear operator from little LP into capital LP, so that in the image of the unit ball, you have the, the nor LP normalized R functions. And this is doing more than that, but that, that's really what, what, what we need. And, I, and uh, so this is the type of thing that you will find analogous things like Zygmunt's book, but we've never seen this, and if anyone's ever seen this limb, I'd like to, like to know about it. We couldn't find it anywhere. And it's proved in what you might guess by, well, you dualize and then you interpolate. You don't use the reason interpolation. You need to use more, well, not modern, but semi-classical interpolation between H1 and and Hilbert space, and you get it. So that's this, and thank you.